The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Welcome to Southeast Linux Fest 2012. Uh, for this session, we have Deb Nicholson. She's a community manager for Media Goblin. She's going to tell us why we are legion, or at least we should be, right? <laughs> I was still on mute. Can people hear me? Yes. Great. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, as my friend here mentioned, I'm the community manager at Media Goblin. That's our project to build a decentralized media hosting uh, framework. So. Um, Instead of sort of a many-to-one relationship, we want to facilitate a many-to-many -many relationship. So I'm going to talk about some of the earlier examples of decentralization or centralization that did or didn't work and why and how those might have bearing on uh, what we're looking at with the web now. And then I'm going to go through which tools have already been built and what tools still need to be built to uh, build the, you know, the full suite of decentralized media services um, or, you know, social, etc. So, let me see. End of that page. Okay, great. <laughs> um, tell me if the display gets wonky. So, um, so this is the very first uh, machine that sent email. This is um, from 1971. Ray Tomlinson uh, sent the first email in the whole world on ARPANET. He's the guy that's responsible for the at symbol. And so at the beginning, email didn't really need to be decentralized because everybody that you wanted to talk to was probably in the same building. Um, so it really didn't matter like whether it was centralized or not. Uh, and so eventually, uh, his initial framework was put onto about 40 machines. And so those were all ARPANET employees. So. Uh, so we started with like a very centralized single type of thing. But when email got a little bit larger, in 1982, there was uh, this simple protocol called SMTP, which probably most of you recognize because we still use it, right? Um, and that was devised, and it became widely used in the early 80s, uh, according to Wikipedia. And I think what they mean by widely used at that point was like everybody who had a computer in 1982. So. Um, so widely used is a pretty low bar at that point. But uh, everything afterwards, as far as email is concerned, was built to work on top of it. And we ended up with a decentralized system. So you know, you can have Hotmail. If, I don't know if people still have Hotmail. But, uh, or Gmail or any other kind of thing on your own domain. But it all talks to each other through that protocol. It's not a perfect protocol, but it is ubiquitous. And it does allow us to have a decentralized service. Um, another example, uh, IRC, which has also been with us for a really long time, is in the semi-decentralized category. So um, in 1982, the Commodore 64 uh, allowed people to send text messages to each other via quantum link for a fee. So as soon as people had computers in their home, they were into this idea of being able to talk instantly with each other. Uh, but those were all siloed. So uh, Quantum Link eventually changed its name to AOL. And then um, people were using AIM. And then other, other formats came around. But until 2000, those formats couldn't talk to each other. So you had like this, again, the siloed thing. And they're all fighting for dominance until uh, Jabber allowed people to combine their streams together and look at all that. And the great thing is uh, Jabber is free software. So anyone can build on top of it. Anyone can. Um, have a server in that with the XMPP, uh, but it's like a client-server relationship. So uh, that means like the various clients don't talk directly to each other. They go via an intermediary. So that's a semi-decentralized service that we already have. Um, oh, if people have questions or are like, wait, wait, no, it was 1981, not 1982. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, I, I don't mind that. Um, so. All of this I've talked about just to let you know that decentralization is possible. And it's possible for huge services that are widely used by lots of people all over the world. So uh, let's look at why we might want or we might prefer decentralization over centralization. So I'm going to go like way back into some of the pitfalls where you can see like kind of writ large from historical perspective why centralization has been uh, problematic. 
So uh, phone, this is like, this is a private company tasked with providing a public good. And um, what you ended up with was a lot of misplaced costs and rampant corruption. So uh, Ma Bell, the telecom industry, had a regulated monopoly that uh, resulted in expensive long distance for people and uh, the expectation of giant government handouts, which we paid for via our tax dollars. So like a government regulated centralized service has that pitfall. Um, and the thing is, is that this is still how telecom operates. Uh, the way that it works is that a company like Verizon, for example, reports a loss on their state filings, and then that in turn lowers their tax bill, but it isn't a real loss. So they've been tasked with providing a service, and then what they've done is they've created two companies that also are called Verizon, Verizon Wireless and Verizon Online, that dump all their expenses into the state agency and then bill them, a vi uh, not bill them, but they pay a very small amount to the state agency. So like, they've put all the expenses in one place and then um, they are only getting a tiny bit of revenue from the other aspects of their own company. So then they report a loss because they're providing all this service and getting a tiny amount of money in. Um, and then it's not just the tax write-off that happens there, it's also they use those numbers to lobby for higher customer rates and for more tax relief. So. Um, so you can see that a centralized service has its problems, especially if we decide that it's a public good to have that. Uh, and why is that relevant? It is also how broadband operates. So uh, we're also giving a few large private companies money to provide broadband, and then they're lying and rigging the numbers to get more money for that project. And we still have a huge digital divide, despite the billions of tax determinants that have been passed out. Um, let me see, I have a number on it. Something, something like 20 million school-aged children as of like two years ago still didn't have internet access even though uh, Verizon had been given money to provide broadband for the whole country. And so um, the estimate is that about $340 billion has been spent to get the entire country wired up for broadband. Um, Someone wanted to give me $340 billion, I could go and spend a year in Wyoming with like a metric ton of Cat5 and probably do a better job, but I wouldn't be getting the massive tax write-off, I guess, so. Um, so that's, that's one issue. Um, the other issue that tends to happen with centralized services is uh, censorship. And so you can see when um, the US Postal Service did a lot of censoring uh, when it didn't have any competition. Now there is some competition for mailing packages and letters, um, FedEx and UPS and things like that. But when they were the only game in town, they took it upon themselves to also regulate the sorts of things that people mailed. So like no beer advertisements, no condoms in the mail or what have you. Um, and that, this law was actually on the books until 1963. So, um, all of these things that you might mail uh, were not allowed to be sent via the U.S. Postal Service. And that effectively meant that you couldn't send them because there wasn't another way to send things. Um, in uh, 1973, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, they kind of scaled back what's obscene and they decided that just like unnatural sex acts and that kind of stuff um, would be obscene and that you could go ahead and send beer advertisements and stuff. But uh, finally, in 1983, the court said the government should not reduce the adult population to reading what is only fit for children. So from 1873 to 1983, they had a pretty long run of deciding what we could and couldn't send to each other. So, um, I mean, uh, the internet now is, is full of all kinds of stuff like this, but uh, if you had a situation where you had like centralized news, you could see where the problem would come in of having one arbiter of that kind of information. So uh, the other thing that, um, so now we'll, we'll get a little bit closer into the, the present. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 uh, resulted in a lot of centralizing of television station ownership. And so you can see that uh, that squeeze resulted in a very particular kind of um, squashing of voices. So um, 1996 was the first time that the internet was included in the broadcasting and spectrum allotment. So those are all like yoked together as well. And uh, it allowed for a lot of media cross ownership. And so uh, the huge consolidation meant 
big giveaways to the outlets, the, the larger outlets, um, and represent a uh, very poor representation of women and minorities. So it's um, basically like the larger companies that had more money for ad revenue were the ones that won in the massive deregulation. And uh, the folks that lost were women and people of color. And so um, it, you can see like right after the deregulation, these numbers like went to where they are now. And this is, this is, a, this is maybe like two years old, but. Uh, you also see really similar numbers for radio. Like radio was also consolidated. So like give or take a couple of tenths of a percentage, you have the same kinds of problems. And the reason that that's an issue is that you get certain kinds of news from, you know, everyone has their own perspective on things. And so if you're getting like mainly like a moneyed white male, like very entrenched perspective, that's one perspective and then you're not getting as much of the other perspective. So consolidation tends to be a survival of the wealthiest and you know so that's you can see why that might be um, problematic I can I could stump on that one for a long time but <laughs> um, free press incidentally is a uh, they're an organization that believes that a well-informed citizenry is really critical to working democracy which I also happen to believe but I I would like to make sure that we provide a web that includes everybody and includes all different kinds of voices so um, let's talk about the web. A series of tubes. So, um, as I mentioned, there's still a massive uh, digital divide where we have about, uh, what did I say, 20 million school-aged children still don't have access to the internet. So, um, so that's a problem. We also have, um, uh, oh yeah, so here we go. So in that Telecommunications Act, we had, um, at the turn of the century, 2000, the United States was ranked fifth among the world's nations in broadband. But then a few short years later, as we have sort of like slid and de-emphasized that, we dropped to about 22nd place. So uh, we're not really leading the, uh, you know, the technological revolution of getting internet to everybody anymore. Um, so, so that's that's like a separate problem, and then. Uh, when we look at the services that we do have, we see a lot of things where we have like just one service in a specific niche. So you have, you know, like Facebook, everybody uses that for social media. And then like Flickr, everybody uses that to share pictures. And Twitter, everybody uses that for microblogging. And that has its own problems. So even once you get over the hump of getting everybody uh, into the internet revolution, which we're a little slow on, uh, you still have a lot of problems. And I'll go through like kind of the main ones. Um, the first, uh, which should come as no surprise, uh, privacy and security. So when you have a one size fits all, which is like the, you know, or a lowest common denominator where the person who forgets their password like every week is, uh, is being accommodated, then you, you have certain kinds of problems. Even when you don't have that, um, you know, like LinkedIn just had all their, lack, all their passwords hacked this week. So um, everyone is in one place, which means like everyone gets hacked at once instead of a decentralized service where they would have to go and get like each of the specific instances. Or, you know, it limits the range of like the security vulnerabilities. Um, the, you know, that one size fits all is, isn't, isn't very good for privacy either. So like if you look at Facebook, because um, they're not particularly responsive to privacy concerns, uh, you, you don't really have another place to go. You'd be like, I'm, I'm out of here. I mean, except that everybody I know is still on here. So, so it, makes it, it makes it difficult when you have like a single entity for a specific thing. Um, overt censorship, so that's, that's a problem. Um, you know, where you see like someone decides that like a gay couple kissing is uh, offensive and so then that gets taken down. Or uh, anti-corporate messages, like all it takes is a message from the corporation to say like, oh, we think that might be slander and it's like maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but um, you know, Joe user versus like massive company sending a message isn't gonna, that isn't gonna weigh out. Fair use also gets kind of trampled on this. You see it a lot on YouTube where um, maybe it's satire because like they drew mustaches on everybody in the video, but other than that, it's just like a CNN video or something. And then you might get that taken down because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit their fair use or they don't feel like going to bat for an individual user instead of, uh, instead of the company that sent them the, the copyright takedown message. 
Um, and then you see analogs in print media all the time where things that the advertisers on the website don't like turn into what goes in or what doesn't go into the paper or to the magazine. So, you know, there's, um, there's a couple of examples of like tobacco companies leaning really hard on magazines doing stories about like health impacts for tobacco and they're like, uh, we advertise in the magazine and then it turns out our Marlboro ad is right opposite like a story about lung cancer. So do you want the tobacco money or do you want the, you know, expose on lung cancer? And it's like, well, the tobacco money we get every month. So you can see where that goes. Um, so consolidation of online services can also use to lead to less diversity of viewpoints. So uh, YouTube and other places that kind of attract a really toxic comment culture. So um, that means that if you ever see like a video, like if someone puts up videos of their kids, like they usually have to disable the comments altogether. Like they can't have any comments because like they want their kids to be like, oh look, I put it up and then you heard there's comments and then there's someone like, you know, I do her when she's legal and it's like, what? No, no. So like. YouTube comments um, end up repelling other types of, I'm sure you guys have seen stuff where you're just like, how did, how does this person function and, and think that that's okay to put on the internet. Um, other types of social norms get set up and perpetuated on other sites. So certain media rises to the top because people really like it, does, regardless of whether it's true or useful. So you see like on Dig and Reddit, like, you know, something that might be useful and impactful like sinks to the bottom of the page where like people are talking about like who so and so like actor is sleeping with or drunken brawl or whatever like rises to the top. So you have this like sort of um, what's it like a tyranny of like the the comments where like nothing nothing that talks about other than the majority like rises to the top. Um, one of the things that we could have with decentralized services would be customized online identities. So um, instead of choosing to be fully anonymous or fully public, which is a lot of times the sort of situation that you have on, on online services or depending on the service, like you have different varying degrees of what you can do. But instead of having like the off the rack with like a free software service, you could decide like, oh, I want this part to be public and I want this part to be anonymous and I want to finally gain uh, control over that situation. So like um, if you're sharing pictures, for instance, and this is one of the examples we think about at Media Goblin, you, when you do Flickr, it's like you share it with everybody or you share it with like an invite only, but you don't have as much um, control for say groups. And so the example that we always think of is like an elementary school might be taking pictures of like the plants or the gerbil they're taking care of or whatever, and they might want to share it with other elementary schools, but not the wider internet. And so being able to have like more kinds of like groups or gradations in the amount of like public versus private when you share um, is one of the things that a decentralized service would be able to provide. So you would be able to get like exactly what you want. And you could also be the curator of your own media and your own sorts of feeds and pick a little bit more specifically like what you get. Um, big also means um, less responsive. So that's another one of the pitfalls of a centralized service. Uh, there was a lady who lost her Twitter account because um, her blog name was the same as a company that had you know, just incorporated within the past year and she'd been using that Twitter handle for seven years. But when Twitter got the note, like some lady is using our company name and we want it. And they're like, oh, okay. But then she, she had lots of followers and so she contacted a lot of them individually and did eventually get her name back. But it took a long time and, and a big process and a lot of effort on her part to get this like huge public groundswell of like, hey, give me my Twitter handle back. So. And, and that's not, it's not illegal. Like when you sign a term of service, you say, I will put all this stuff on and then you can do whatever you want with it, including erasing it or wiping me off the site entirely as, as you see fit without any process or any kind of notification. Um, one of my friends has, uh, he grew up with someone whose last name is Deeth, D-E-A-T-H. And uh, she wanted to be on LinkedIn and Facebook with her actual legal name, which looks like the word death. So it gets twigged as, um, as like a fake. 
so people are like, you can't really be Molly Death on Facebook. That's not a real name. She's like, no, it really is. It is really her name. Um, and so she, you know, she loses out. She sent messages. She never gets any response. So she's, a, she's on there as a fake name when she wanted to be on there using her real name. And, you know, so you don't have a lot of responsiveness. And that also means that uh, new features come out slowly and not because of user demand, but because of like advertiser demand or some other kind of uh, driving force. So unless the users demand something in like really large numbers, and sometimes even not still then, you don't see any kind of changes that is, are user driven. So, so those are problems. Um, let's take a look at some of the existing services today. Uh, so um, how many people in here use StatusNet or Identica? Okay, and this room is maybe a little bit, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a larger representation than uh, in the rest of the world, I, I imagine. Um, Twitter is obviously still much more popular. Do the people that use Identica also use Twitter? Yeah or no? Yeah, so you use both? Okay, or about half, it seems, okay. And so, um, yeah, so, but there are a lot of great tools, which I'm gonna get into in the next minute or two. Uh, Media Goblin is the project that I work on. Um, media hosting using free software, that turned out to be the easier problem. And then gracefully federating turned out to be the harder problem, which is probably comes as no surprise. But um, so we're working on that piece now. Uh, Diaspora, it, uh, it works as a system of pods, uh, but so far I think they just have the one uh, main instance, so it's not, it's not working in the same way that Identica is, where there's a lot of other instances happening within businesses and communities. Yeah? There are other pods running. There are other pods running. Okay. Is it? It's not as popular as Right, right. Oh, okay. All right. So get a pod. Um, and then uh, Friendica sort of is another layer on top of uh, the existing social media. And so uh, that's free software and it gives you a single stream. So there's some tools there that might be useful in building other tools. Um, and they, in specific, they've uh, repurposed a lot of the Identica stuff. They're both PHP projects. So, um, you know, the sharing back and forth is pretty easy there. And then uh, BuddyCloud is a federated social network that uses XMPP. So that's like built on the, the Jabber stuff that we talked about before. And, um, but it doesn't really feel very web-like. And again, it has that like having to go up to the server so the clients still have a mediator in between. So, um, so you know, that's not the same as like, you know, running pods or specific instances. So uh, these are some of the tools that have already been built. Um, the great news is that there are like a million free software web development libraries. Um, and uh, the GitHub attitude of being like, let's do everything like almost all the way open source means that there are a lot of freely licensed tools, but the job doesn't get finished because each project has a little bit of like secret sauce that is proprietarily licensed. So, you know, you'd have to add your own secret sauce if you want to use those. Uh, but there are still a lot of things. So. Um, uh, the serving between instances, like the old style is to use a pull, which is uh, sort of, um, it's, it's resource intensive if you're doing a lot of small instances. So like if you go on vacation for a week and you decide not to microblog while you're there, everyone who's following you in a pool kind of a situation would be sending messages to your server that whole week that you're just on the beach in Jamaica. Um, Push is a huge boon for decentralized services because it means that when you come back, you're just like, hey guys, I had a great vacation, it was awesome. And so you just push something out instead of having all this like back and forth, like, do you have anything new yet? Do you have anything new yet? Um, Salmon is a push for private messages. So like if, you know, a lot of social media has the private messages um, and that's great. So that's already built. Uh, the XMPP we talked about. Um, RSS, Adam, there is, uh, there is like someone working to build some decentralized services with Adam. Uh, and then OStatus, if you, if you are a developer and you're interested in working on decentralized services, I would say go and check out, the first thing you should look at is the OStatus suite of tools. There's like tons and tons of stuff that's already built there. Um, and uh, you know, no point in reinventing the wheel because it's all free software, so you don't have to. Um, 
as well as uh, so as as well as like the sharing across instances. There's also a lot of identity management tools already built, like OpenID and Browser ID. Um, Webfinger is a great one for um, yeah. Well. Uh, is a great one for accessing public stuff. So if you want to search and see if your friend is on a specific network, you can use that. Um, OAuth has a lot of single sign-on tools. GPG is secure, but the user interface isn't great. Um, a number of years ago, I was trying to work with some folks to build GNU Social, which would have been like a, you know, like a completely free software, AGPL, uh, social media, and we had this, what we thought, this brilliant idea, like, we'll base it on GPG. We thought we were the first people that ever thought of it. We're not. Uh, there were a couple of other, like, failed, like, pretty crufty looking projects that are also social media based on GPG. Um, the thing about GPG is that uh, people forget their passwords. They just do. And especially on social media when it's, like, low stakes. It's one thing if you, you know, are, working to make a revolution happen in like some country and you really need to send private messages, then you pay good attention and you remember your GPG key. But if you're just like, hey guys, I just ate a cheese sandwich, like the stakes are really low, so people tend to lose their password for that stuff. So plus the UX isn't great. Um, there are Sam and Magic signatures. Those are really good um, and working great so far. So um, those, uh, it has encryption built in. And so that's, that's great. And then SSL is another tool for secure web browsing. So there are a lot of tools for identity management. So if, if you're thinking like, oh, I have this great idea for like a free software, decentralized you know, web service, don't go building your own identity management tools because there are tons that already exist. Um, is anyone thinking about doing that? Maybe not yet. Is it too early for like a brand new software project to percolate up? Okay. Um, so these are the parts that need work. Um, so two of the really hard problems are decentralized search. So when you want to look for groups and tags across a whole bunch of interest, uh, instances that are loosely federated together, you hit a lot of problems. So, um, so that's one of the, the hard problems. And then the categorization, and then are you, did you want to ask a question? Well, say, will centralized search be with a Yasi? With a what? Yasi. Yasi? Hmm, I don't know about Yasi. Yasi is a really decentralized search engine. It's peer to peer. Great. Okay. So Yasi is peer to peer. Okay. And then, so who is using that and for what? There are, well, look, their main network, there are thousands of millions of people. They're all over the world. Great. Okay. Oh, so that's like general search of the internet. Okay. So, yeah, this would be like, for specific instances and services, but um, it's possible that that could be. Uh... I'm sorry? So you could use it for your own project. Awesome. I'll take a look. Um, one of the other problems that uh, decentralized services have been struggling with is spam handling. OSATIS is, uh, is doing a pretty good job with that on the microblogging, but um, uh, they have like a certain size and you know, as they get bigger, scaling up with the spam control is really difficult. The way that most centralized services use uh, do spam control is they have like a huge volume of information, so they have a lot of up-to-the-minute data on what is and what isn't spam, and then because they're centralized, they just send to one place. This is the new definition of what is and isn't spam, but with decentralized services, you would have a whole loose federation of sites that would all be getting spam. So spam control across federated small instances is its own sort of special problem to do um, well. So if that's a, a thing that is exciting to you, then um, the decentralized web service world could totally use your talents. Um, so the other thing where I think um, we need a lot of work is it needs to be pretty. Um, how many times have you uh, tried to get a friend to use something that is free software and they've looked at it and been like, no? Anyone? Yeah. And they're like, immediately they're like, where's the button? What is the black box? Why do I have to type in this weird string of letters? Like, so uh, I think in order to see a lot of adoption on decentralized services, we have to work a lot on user interface. So that means if you're a designer or a UX expert, um, there's a lot of great stuff 
that uh, could use your help. <laughs> so, um, People are used to a really slick gra graphical user interface, and they're used to having stuff called like you know something that makes sense, and not having to hop out to the command line to make it really work. And so, um, decentralized services are going to have to hit a certain standard before uh, we're going to see a lot of adoption. So that's more that's like kind of approaching the social problem. Um, the other thing is it's it's going to have to be easy. Um, I did this talk at uh, Linux Fest Northwest, and I was told that actually the poodle is the easiest balloon animal, which I didn't know. But um, it, doesn't, it didn't look easy to me, because I've never made any balloon animals. Um, are we have balloon animal experts in the audience? No. One. Awesome. Uh, is the poodle actually easy? That one is. OK. All right. So yeah. Um, so the, the point of that is that one person's easy is another person's like, uh, no, no, I don't know. You do it. So um, in order to see wide adoption and lots of people hosting their own instance, uh, free software decentralized services are going to have to be as easy as installing WordPress on your blog is today. So um, in, the, in the little dashboard when you sign up to get web hosting, you're going to have to be able to click a button that's like, oh, yeah, I'd like to also have my own microblogging. And I'd also like to host my own media and just click a button, and it's going to have to work just like that. Right now, there's too many steps. And that's even for Media Goblin. And I'm constantly uh, trying to push us to get more you know, user friendliness, better directions. And you know, we still have a lot of problems. Um, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's, it's still difficult. Um, there might be some tools that are being built today that could help us uh, abstract the deployment a little bit better. So like uh, OpenShift or maybe Juju might give us a little bit, uh, you know, people would have another layer of abstraction and not have to uh, get into the details. So um, I think it's going to have to be really easy for someone without any technical knowledge to host um, their own instance of microblogging, their own instance of media sharing, or, or, or whatever else we're going to build, right? So, um, so I would like to see more people working on decentralized services. So this, this, this is my general pitch. Um, that's crowd surfing, you guys know. Um, so there's a couple different ways you could help. You could help with an existing project like, uh, like StatusNet or Media Goblin or Buddy Cloud or something um, as a designer or a coder or a translator or a documenter. Um, you could help start new projects that uh, don't either already exist as a proprietary analog or ones that don't exist at all. So um, some of the things that um, I think could be neat to see centralized would be like LinkedIn. Obviously, centralizing is not working great there, but like you know, I think um, different industries might like to have different types of uh, things that they track and ways that they interact with people. Um, traffic is another thing that I think you know could be decentralized, where you have like each city might keep track of their own traffic so that when you look at what's going on, like for instance, um, Boston versus New York have really different needs for traffic. Like New York is a grid, and if you have a problem like 20 blocks over here, then you know you're going to have a problem down here because it's all on this massive grid. So it has its own patterns, whereas Boston is a whole craggy little pile of streets. And we have seasonal traffic. Like, we have a huge student population. So stuff that's a traffic -y nightmare um, during the school year is like free sailing like all through the summer. So. Um, and then they, the great thing would be is as you drive from one place to another is if you could just seamlessly pick up like great um, you know, forecasts of what the traffic you're going to hit is going to be like in each city as you go forward. But not having like a one size fits all because then you end up with sort of like an unrealistic expectation of like how long is this traffic going to happen and you know, what can I do to avoid it and is that likely to fill up immediately as soon as everyone else sees that Route 1 is, is blocked up. Um, 
Healthcare data is another thing that might be great to see decentralized, like to have a lot of like interoperability between that data, but not have exactly the same data in each place. Like um, obviously there's different needs and the way that the data has been collected is different. And so, you know, um, so there's a lot of different places uh, that you could see that. And I think there would be a lot of use to being able to aggregate some of the higher level healthcare data, but not necessarily do a one size fits all on the individual person's data, right? So. Um, so maybe start a new project that um, fills another federated need. Um, another way that you could help is try running an instance of an existing project and then filing bugs. There you'll find some, I promise, and um, and and give feedback on how how the directions were, like how long it took, and um, how well it works, and you know for all different kinds of situations. And, uh, and then if you, if you don't want to do any of those things, I'm sure you could throw money at one of the existing projects. Like, we'll take money. I'm sure OStatus will take money. Uh, maybe you want to have uh, like a federated instance within your company. There's a lot of um, microblog like, within, certain, within individual, individual companies that happens. And you know, so you could fund having your own custom in, instance inside of your company or your school or what have you. So. Um, Let's see. I spoke really fast because I drank a lot of coffee this morning. Um, so that's the and that's um, those are my picture credits. And um, so I would love to hear from you guys. This is obviously it's an evolving uh, thing. The decentralized stuff. It's like there's always like little bits and pieces coming up all the time. Um, W3C tracks a lot of uh, the work going into decentralized services, but they you know, have a uh, burst of excitement and then um, a lot of inactivity in that. And so like, you know, like when I looked at their stuff from two years ago, there's like 15 projects on there that have completely disappeared, like, and, and those are all gone. So, you know, if you know of new services, I'd like to hear about them. Um, and, uh, but other than that, any kind of general questions, um, I'm gonna open up for questions. Yeah. 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 Right. So that's a larger. Um, so the question is, uh, I had mentioned one person's easy is another person's hard, and that um, often reporting bugs, which I recommend doing, uh, becomes like a long, drawn-out process of going to Git and then uh, finding out that there's a bunch of dependencies that aren't mentioned in the README and that that is a problem. So that, especially with smaller projects with just three or four people. Um, they don't understand how important that is and how do you fix that. So that's, is that, that's basically the question. Um, I think that that is, uh, that is not specific to uh, federated projects, but it certainly impacts the uptake of federated projects. Um, I think that the free software community has to either decide, like, are we just building this for ourselves or are we building this because we want people to use it? And, if we decide that we want people to use the tools that we're building, then we have to be serious about making it usable and being friendly and um, having the user interface be good. Um, and that means, that means like inviting people in and being like, I will bribe you with beer or cookies. Please, please, please try and install this. Like, and then tell me how it goes. Or let me sit with you and then I'll keep feeding you cookies. You know, and so um, I think, uh, 
they absolutely have to ask for help. Uh, not putting dependencies in the README is, uh, you might as well just say like, I don't, I don't care if anyone uses this. I mean, I used to do package verification for the Free Software Foundation, and, and I would try and download stuff, and then it would be like, oh, you're missing this and this and this, and it was like, do you really want anyone to use this? Like, they sent me a note saying, like, please put this in the free software directory so other people can find it. But then they hadn't listed all the dependencies, even in the README. And I'm like, what, what is that? You know, and so I think that that uh, is a cultural change that the free software community is going to have to really embrace if we want to see all of the benefits of free software uh, go beyond our own community. So um, I think that's really critical, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And so I, um, I don't know if you want, like, there's no silver bullet there, so, like, I, I can't, like, you know, wrap that uh, kind of comment and question up with a, like, and then just put in a table of contents or whatever, so. But, yeah. So that, that's, that's great. And I, I could talk about that for a long, long time on how free software projects could do a better job of you know, getting more users and getting more um, help within their projects. So, Do people have other questions or comments? Uh, over here and then over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was interested to see that, and I was actually hoping that my host would offer the same for StatusNet, because I was interested in hosting my own StatusNet uh, instance. Mm -hmm. I, I looked into um, setting it up myself, just didn't have the chops, and I didn't have anything to admit it's obviously Linux fest, but I was not sure. <laughs> this is a safe space. It's OK. Right, right. So, so I, I thought, well, one quick installation might, might be cool. And my host didn't offer it, so I thought, all right, well, I'll contact technical support and ask about the possibility of offering one quick installation. And the response mm -hmm. we got back was basically, we can't consider just any response or any request that we get. We can help you, and the end, that was it. That was the end of the response. And that was from your web host? That was from the web host, yes. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, what might be a good strategy to encourage web hosts to adopt more one quick installations of decentralized mm -hmm. uh, media services? Or how can we replicate the success that WordPress seems to mm -hmm. achieve? Because to me, it seems like that there is sort of a widespread adoption of that service, um, and how can we, like, what might be some good strategies? Right. So the question is, what might be some good strategies for um, getting other uh, free software services to adopt the one-click thing that WordPress has for web hosts right now? I think the question there might first go to who has done the um, interstitial work to make the one-click WordPress installation happen. And so I think like an individual user saying like I really wish there was one quick in one click installation for X Y Z is going to be less uh, useful in pushing web host services to do that than hey I run this decentralized service and uh, we made a really pretty thing that has like a very clear value for a person with a website and um, all you have to do is put it in. It's the same thing for when you want to get like something covered by the press. You don't like say like, hey, uh, my friend at the press, like will you cover my project? You say, hey, I wrote like five paragraphs. The first three are if you want a short version of the story. And if you want to get into more depth, then you can print all five. Let me know if you have questions or I left something out. So like, you've done the work and then said, like, please include it in your existing resource. So I think the existing, uh, you know, the work needs to be done and then can be handed first. So I think that probably needs to happen. And then, then it, you know, and it still might take a little bit of people asking and saying like, oh, how come the one click thing isn't here? Like, I saw it's available and then give them a link again. Like, I want one click status net. So if they get a whole bunch of notes with a link to like, you know, here it is, then I think it would seem easy. Whereas your initial request sounded like, can you do a bunch of work on behalf of a project that you may never have heard of? Which is a much harder ask, I think. So, yeah. And then uh, we had a question over here. How do you plan on dealing with network effects of existing services? Like, let's say Facebook, for example. Mm -hmm. Why are people on Facebook specifically? Everyone knows the site sucks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The best competitor I've ever seen at Facebook to date has been Google Plus, which I had a high school launch, but 
Oh, yeah, I've seen those ones too. No treatises for you? All right. Yeah, uh, so the question is about the network effects of existing services and how do you deal with the, like, the very real social problem of like, why would I use your weirdo free software thing when all of my friends are on you know, Facebook or what have you? Um, I think that uh, there's, probably, there's probably some lessons to be learned from things like WordPress where it's kind of like, oh, well, if you have a website, like, of course you have a blog on it. Like, why would you not have a blog? And making it, like, normal and be like, oh, everyone's website now has this, like, oh, check out, I have my own microblog and I have my own thing. Um, so that's one thing, like making it more normal and, and having more conversations about it. And that's a pretty diffuse thing. Um, I think the, the second piece of that would be the one of the great things about free software is that we can add all kinds of little like bells and whistles and, and uh, customizations that make it kind of fun like and, and interesting like um, you know like like I was talking about, like being able to really finally control the privacy and the sharing on uh, your media hosting, that could you know be really appealing to specific folks, and then and then they're using it in that instance, and then maybe would see the value of it in other places. So there might be um, ways that we could improve upon existing network services that would make people like. Oh, hey, how come like you get to share like weirdo video things or like why is it really easy for you to share like music clips on your social media but not on mine? Like or you know, whatever it is. So like I think um, maybe like the challenge is to find ways to make the free software service like just a little bit cooler. And I, I don't know exactly like how we do that. I mean I have lots of ideas, but I don't know how to implement them all in code. So I think that making them a little bit cooler, and then talking to people about the very real, like, this is, you know, why I do it and why I think it's important and why I think, it, or why I think it's great, like, depending on whether you're, you know, talking about privacy or talking about an additional uh, sort of feature. Does that so, sort of, I mean, again, there's no silver bullet, so I can't just be like, and then put sparkles on it, so, which I wish I could. <laughs> so, I don't know, I mean, if other people have, do you have a question or a comment on what you think would make network uh, the network effects? All right, over here and then in the green. Thanks. I think we have another problem, and that is the direction of the technology has been towards the devices. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not really going to be able to get into these devices necessarily. You know, Apple, mm -hmm. we're not going to want these with people their services. Mm -hmm. How are we going to overcome that? What are we going to do with that? Hmm. Like right now, we can go ahead and put a client out there and say, we will replace it. But are you going to convince people to install it when you've already got Twitter, you've already got Google Plus, you've already got all this? That might fall. Yeah. Um, 
So the question is, though, or, or comment, is that we have another problem uh, in that the devices are locked down and they come already, like, you know, yeah, prepared to have um, the proprietary services and the, the main centralized services work really easily with your phone and people are used to that. Um, and the vendors don't want to support like our free software decentralized services. Um, yeah, I, I do agree that that is another problem, that the devices are locked down and, um, you know, it's, I mean, I think offering like a, you know, it's obviously people, a lot of people prefer apps as opposed to like a web version of a certain site, but uh, having a good web version, which a lot of um, projects don't do now, you know, it's like you, when you look for something on your phone and you're like, ugh, they didn't even bother to do a mobile version. I never understand why restaurants don't do a good mobile version of their website, but that's another rant. Um, so I think having a good mobile version of, uh, of your decentralized service is one place to start. But I think uh, in the hardware realm, we need to keep pushing on um, having devices that are open. It's difficult because you know Nokia is, you know, isn't doing the stuff anymore. They're going with the Windows Mobile. And um, you know, even the Android stuff, like I had uh, one of the older G1s and, and that came with like almost no stuff. And now I have like a newer Android phone and it came with like a whole bunch of garbage that I had to like oust from there. Um, and there doesn't happen to be like, uh, there's so many phones now, there doesn't happen to be uh, a, a good, you know, script for rooting that particular phone. Because I got the one that was cheap and then they didn't make very many of that one, so no one figured out how to root that one. So like, I have a bunch of garbage on there, I think. But um, it's, uh, I think that's like a parallel, but uh, and necessary, but it's like a little bit separate, like the push for um, continuing to have access on our mobile devices. But for the decentralized side, the, I think one of the critical pieces that still isn't fully in place is making sure that there's always a great mobile version of your site. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like, people don't... Right. People, people microblog when they're waiting for the bus or sitting in the airport. And so, like, if they can't use, like, the free one in that same way... I mean, how many... Uh, we have Identica users. What do people use to um, microblog on Identica? I have mustard on my phone. And that's what you've got. Yeah, everyone has mustard. It's not perfect. But yeah, <laughs> but it, it does, it more or less does the job. So yeah, so that's, um, yeah, I think uh, it, it, it intersects with a lot of other issues um, working on decentralized stuff. But uh, yeah, underestimating the ubiquitousness of mobile devices is not gonna, is not gonna be the way to go, for sure. And then uh, we had over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, Twitter kind of blog that one of the self I self uh, they email itself um, you know, was useless except for contacting other defense researchers. And that was sort of initially to make people start using it. Right. Okay, so the, the comment is uh, that things like Twitter and email uh, came about because of a specific need in a specific community at a specific time, and that uh, one way to increase adoption of free software decentralized services would be to piggyback on a big event like this one or something else and make sure that you know people are like you know like they do sometimes where their IRC nick on their name tag and then you'd add like maybe also your Identica handle and and all that stuff um, and that 
uh, yeah, that really like making sure that it's not uh, and I think this is a, a crucial point that it's not a if we build it they will come it's like no we have to like go to where they are load them all in the bus and drive them over to where it is and then be like until you make an account like you can't leave or, or we'll all be grumpy at you I, I, no sticks but um, yeah I agree and then making it like the, the fun thing like where it's like hey let's all do it right now you know so um, yeah, so uh, in the spirit of that, if you don't have an Identica account yet, you should sign up for one. Um, do people have other questions or comments or um, things? Right here in the front. Um, so I've, I've had a blog for, I don't know, a long time since I was That's decentralized about all the services and all the things that are going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, um, so the question comment is that uh, you've had your blog for a long time, but then people always want to know, like, why don't you put status updates about your decentralized blog on social media and things. Yeah. Oh, we agree. Right. So Right. So so how do we educate people about the availability of decentralized services or the yeah. desire, like why they might want them? Yeah, I guess it wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. No, I think, uh, we yeah, we have Kickstarter now, I guess. <laughs> right. So, uh, the, yeah, like how do we overcome that? Um, you know, the, the, how do we crawl out of the pit of obscurity that most uh, decentralized stuff lives in right now when everybody wants to know, like, why didn't you talk about your decentralized service on Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> They're like, well, sort of missing the point. Although I'll admit, Media Goblin has a Twitter feed. I barely look at it, but when we update stuff, we put it there. I, and I realize how ridiculously ironic that is. But, um, you know, we were like, well, you know, and we also have a diaspora account and an Identica account too, but um, yeah, I don't know, like uh, Evan uh, Fedorama, who works on OStatus, he, he works on, um, he thinks one way is to constantly post via the free software service to the proprietary service. So people will be like, how come that one's always coming from something called StatusNet? I don't know if that works. Um, I think it's probably a combination of having a lot of individual conversations with everybody and then also making sure that when people are like, okay, okay, you've been talking about this thing forever, like, where is it? How do I get to it? And then when they finally look at it, they're like, oh, it's awesome. It's way better than I thought it was going to be. Like, because when you showed me, you know, like, GIMP in 2005, that wasn't so great, you know, like, or whatever. It's better now, but um, I think it's, it's important to make sure that, you know, like we're having the educational conversations, but then when we come, we're like, oh, uh, you know, it's like inviting someone over for a sandwich and you're like, I put the bread out in the yard and the ham is in a bucket in the bathroom and then like we might or might not have mustard. And it's like, you invited me over for a ham sandwich. This sucks. 
So making sure that it's like, no, I already made them and I cut the crust off if that's what you like, whatever. And, and so having those conversations and then being ready when they're like, okay, how do I do it? And making sure it really is like all put together. So I think, I think we're out of time. Um, my uh, email is here if people think of other questions later that they want to ask me about. And you can always swing by uh, Pound Media Goblin on freedno.net if you uh, have like a, another brilliant idea of how to promote decentralized services or want to um, hack on a great Python project and help us build uh, media hosting. So thank you very much. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like 
a master of all those realms. I think cloud stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.